Hello there, YouTube world and podcast world. Welcome back to another episode, episode 15 of the Struggling Hunters. You got me, Joe Imes, here in Utah, and you got Eric out there in Colorado. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hopefully, everyone's week's been going pretty good. Hopefully, uh, we find you on another day with you waiting to uh, to listen to hear what we have to say and uh, tell us some stories and um, expressing what we what we like to do when we get the free time to be able to take off. And, uh, you know, again, thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Hopefully uh, you're finding, you know, again, finding some enjoyment and some some something you're getting out of this and as much as enjoyment was we're getting, we're putting into it. <laughs> um, anyways, we're going to, today we're going to get going uh, talk about the uh, process of uh, the processing of your game, the uh, techniques that you know we, both of us use, or what, or something we want to change with uh, the next game that we that we take. You know, the process, whatever it is, there will be some tweaks. I'm sure you'll hear us talk about what we want to do different. Um, if you guys have any suggestions or or something you feel we're doing wrong, let us know. We'll definitely take it in consider into consideration and see if we want to add it to what we do. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, that sounds like a plan there. Uh, I mean, you know, we just kind of do what we've always learned or from times past, but I'm sure there's people out there that have pretty good ideas of how, uh, how to process it, animals. Um, getting into that though, like I'll just kind of kick it off and, uh, you know, back in the day, so the one thing that's going to change for me processing my game is I'm going to take it to a processor. Uh, there's a few factors there. Back in the day, I used to do it uh, all myself with me and, and uh, sometimes my, my aunt and uncle would actually uh, help me out quite a bit uh, processing our, my deer and it was really great because they had they had all the equipment. But uh, ever since I moved out to Colorado, um, I don't have I don't have all the stuff. Uh, the other thing is is where we live, it, it gets so hot during the day, even in October or November, it can get so hot out here. Uh, well, I got two things. There's it gets so hot out here that like I don't trust hanging it for a few days. You know, over here in yeah. Colorado, and uh, but then the second thing is too is is in my current situation, I don't really have a place to hang anything. So kind of reeling it back to back in the day, whenever I used to process, we would just do it all ourselves, kind of, you know, take an afternoon and, you know, for three or four hours, five hours, however long it took and process a whole deer. And, um, and it was said and done. Uh, my aunt and uncle had a, had a grinder. So we'd use that to, uh, make our hammer, you know, everything was there. They had all the equipment. And, uh, as of right now, like I said, I just, I'm just not set up for that. So every year that I've went out elk hunting, I planned on doing it. Uh, and to kind of go through what I'm planning on doing is going to a processor this year, but there's a couple things that I'm looking for that I think are pretty important. I mean, if you're listening to this, you probably had your game processed or you process it yourself. Uh, but if, if you're kind of like me and, and don't have the have it set up yet, this is what I'm planning on doing to set it up is, is uh, going to a processor. But I'm looking for a processor that, that cuts up meat all year round. Because a lot of the time during hunt season, these processing uh, places kind of pop up everywhere. And then after hunt season, they disappear. So the one thing that I'm going to look for is, is, you know, if it's the first person that I come across, then that's great. It makes my job easier. But, it, you know, if they're like, yeah, you know, we just kind of open up every, every hunt season and shut back down. I don't think I'm really interested in that. Um, just because I want somebody to do it efficiently. I mean, maybe I'm being a little nitpicky but I just want them to do it efficiently. I want them to have all the right equipment. I don't want, you know, I kind of, so I'm kind of looking more for like a commercial processing place and are somebody you, that has experience. Go ahead. Are, are you scared about, uh, 
I guess one of the 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 fears or uh, fears or one of the I guess maybe a downside uh, to taking it to a, a commercial place in a way, depending on the, how big it is, is um, you know I've always heard that you may not get your particular piece of game meat back or your you know your animal you might be getting someone else's um <laughs> well or not very well taken care of maybe spoiled meat back you know not not your well <laughs> taken care of uh meat taken to the game processor i don't know i that might i don't know how you could ensure that it's uh it is yours coming back. You know, I don't, I don't know what precautions you could take, but I'm going to tattoo every, every <laughs> cut before oh, okay. I take it in there. I'm going to put a little tattoo on there. No, um, actually it's, you asked that question, but that was actually my next point that I was oh. going to get to. Uh, so oh, I'm sorry, looking, go ahead. <laughs> I'm looking for both. So, so some of the reasons because of things that I've heard too, is like people that don't do it all year long, like they'll make bad cuts. They might put in like some of the crappier fat, you know, the, 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 um, the gristly meat and stuff. And so like, I want to avoid that. That's why I kind of want to do somebody that go to somebody that does it more all year round. But with that too, this, my follow up question to, Hey, do you do this all year round? Or is this like a seasonal thing? Um, I was talking to my father-in-law actually this weekend about it, uh, about, uh, who to go to. And, and he said that, uh, um, the last time that he got his process, he went to these people that, uh, I don't know, people listening to this might know or might not know, uh, city market, but it's basically a grocery store. He said that there is a hand, like a family or a handful of guys that they were, uh, they cut meat at the grocery store all year round. But during hunt season, they kind of opened up shop and, and did it that way. And, and I was like, Oh, that, that makes sense. So, you know, they're, they're cutting meat all the time. So they know what they're doing. That's the biggest thing. I just want somebody that knows what they're doing. And, um, but then with that said about the, like, if I, if it is like more of a commercial place and, and getting your own meat, that's my follow up question. And I mean, it'll be hard to prove cause they might say, yeah, you know, we do that. And then they find out that they don't or whatever, but, but that is my, my follow-up question is, you know, Hey, do you uh, make sure that I get all my meat? Um, and, and hopefully I do. And, and um, so that's, that's kind of where, where, what my plan is, is, is uh, make sure that I get all my meat and also that, you know, it's a good established place um, that makes good cuts. Another thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to, do a lot of roasts. So my plan is, I don't know, this is me maybe being a pain, but um, I'm going to, well, I, to me, this is, this is what it comes down to is I think that it, it's easier for them and it's easier for me because if I kind of can get them to make mostly roasts, then I can on thaw that and cut it into steaks if I want, or do, you know, make jerky out of it. Uh, whatever I want to make out of it. That's why I kind of want them to, like, I don't want them to worry about steaks, just kind of cut big roasts up. And then I'll worry about um, what, what, uh, what cuts I want to make out of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that way, I mean, and more or less, you're going to get the whole chunk of meat or, you know, the roast, you know, big roast or whatever. And that's going to give you the freedom to be able to, you know, like I want, this big of a steak or you know this thin of a steak or out i'm feeling like some making some jerky i'm going to go ahead and grab these packages and slice them even thinner and have you know kind of i guess the freedom to do what you want when you have the hankering for whatever it is you want yeah yeah and and my thought too on this is uh is it should make it a little cheaper because they're not spending as much time you know cutting each steak out so so it'll be a little cheaper and yeah, at, yeah. at the end of the day, that's kind of my goal. I mean, that, that's kind of the funny thing about hunting these days is, you know, with, I mean, we've kind of brought it up before, but with buying equipment and everything, by the time you're into it and, and you, you feel like you've got everything you want, you, you could be thousands of dollars into your sport. Right. And, right. but at the end of the day, like for me and the way I grew up is it was all about chasing that, 
meat or that 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 animal for more um not so much for you know showcase but more for you know feeding the family for the for the winter so i still have that mentality in my head where i'm like i don't want to spend a bunch of money at the processing place and that's also another reason why i used to process all my stuff because i was too cheap to take it to a processor (laughs) and (laughs) so but i still have that mentality today where it's like uh I, I, I want to make it as cheap as possible for it to all make sense. You know, I don't want to spend all this money and that, you know, take well, it's it like one of the, it's one of those things too. Like I once had a boss when I went in to ask for a, uh, for time off work, he's all, you realize you can buy a side of beef for 500 bucks, right? <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> He's like, all right. <laughs> I was like, I enjoy that. I enjoy being out there. I mean, I'd be money ahead if I uh, bought a beef every, you know, a side of beef every year versus trying to fill a tag. I've had, you know, like I, my success rate is on the lower side. I'm hopeful. Hopefully that changes. But if I'd done that in the last, you know, five, six, seven years, I'd I'd have more meat in the freezer, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah, exactly. And more money in the bank. But again, you know, it kind of comes back to what you said, you know, it's it's something I enjoy doing. So yeah, I guess I'm going to put a little bit out there, but at the same time, I don't want to break the bank every year, but yeah, well, my, my rebuttal to that though is, uh, I don't think this podcast would be too entertaining if we called it the struggling beef buyers. (laughs) that's so. true <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so with that said like i mean that's that's kind of really my plan in a nutshell is just uh taking it to a processor um hope you know hoping that they either kind of do it as a professional year round or or it is like a more commercial processing place where they do do it all year round and uh and then also uh the main thing is making sure that i get all my meat um and then and then to tie it all off i i'm gonna do mostly so i do want to do like some sausage and some um uh salami oh summer sausage uh, summer sausage yeah sorry uh summer sausage i'll let that slide (laughs) yeah yeah. uh summer sausage and uh and and regular sausage and then some hamburger and then uh they say like hamburger i mean it's like 50 percent of your uh animal give or take a little bit but so so i feel like i got a lot of option there with the ham to do the sausage and summer sausage i got a lot of option i mean it's 50 percent of the so that i'll put i'll spend a little extra money toward that so i guess i'm kind of kind of putting my foot in my mouth saying that i want to save money but then i talk about <laughs> wanting to make sausages but sausage is good, man. Wild game sausage is the bomb. Yeah, so. no, it is. I think that's the only time I've – so I have taken my I, – a deer I got a handful of years ago. I had, a, you know, a, a bunch of scrap meat. And I was like, ah, you know, I, I want some sausage. So I took it to a processing plant. I think they kind of laughed at me. I mean, that's – they kind of did stuff all year round, but they that's what they're – they were there for, like, the hunts. And I think I showed up with like, oh, maybe four pounds of meat. You know, I was like, <laughs> like, hey, can you process my deer for me? You know, I got some meat. And they're like, sure, yeah, bring it in. <laughs> so I bring in like, this, this bag. <laughs> and like, do you want me to leave my tag? <laughs> or I can't remember how all went. There's a couple of questions. And I was, they're like, they looked over at it. And like, uh, with that amount don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so you you pretty much cut up everything on your own and then just had some scraps left over right and i didn't want to make the sausage so i, was, so I took it into them and i i don't know if i got my the amount that i i took i don't know if i got mine back i don't know if i you know it's like i said it was only like maybe six pounds of, of meat i took them. oh that, that's funny that's even funnier <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> but I mean, the sausage that I got back was was good sausage, but yeah. I don't know how much if it was mine or not. But <laughs> <laughs> what'd you what'd you get? Like two meals out of it? No, I actually got like I, I maybe it was more than six pounds because I got like 
it seems like out back, you know, like a good handful of packages. Like yeah. it was, it was less than ten, but more than three. <laughs> That's cool though. That's funny. Yeah, I just remember bringing in. Yeah, just bring it on in here. It's like, all right, here you go. Yeah, <laughs> just a couple pounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, kind of to further the further it along, though, is there, I mean, is there anything that you're gonna do different or planning on doing different? Um, you know, so the way that that the <laughs> i pro i so i i process all my own anything that i've tagged i've i've processed myself and it's only been deer and uh and like i've never had a place to hang it never taken any place to hang to or to cure before i i butchered it so you know like after you know i've always brought everything back except for one year I, I deboned it all out on the in the field anyways i've always come home and the first thing i've always done is uh being that i don't have a place to hang it or a freezer to, or fridge to cure it in um is i've always put it in an ice chest um soaked it in water and ice for two to three days um that's all i've always that's always worked out well for me i've i've never had a bad tasting deer you know that everything's always come out great but i don't let i don't soak it in the same water for those three days i i, I drain the water and put a put fresh ice fresh water in it once a day you know i always make sure there's ice in it i don't you know i don't ever let the meat the water get too warm or too you know it's always ice ice temperature not quite not freezing i guess in a way otherwise it'd be a block but it's and then I, you know, change out the water. And then three days later, I pull it out and turn my kitchen into a little butcher shop. And I don't understand the different cuts of meat or nothing. That's one of, oh, what I'm gonna do different is I wanna get, I probably, I wanna get like a poster that has like a, how to cut the different cuts of meat out. So that way I know where the cuts are coming from. You know, like I always just grab a chunk of meat and I go, oh, that's gonna be a steak. You know, that looks like a roast. I don't know where it's coming from, but like, you know, there's a chunk of meat. So that's going to be a roast. And oh, it looks like something I can make jerky out of. I get, Oh, I got a bunch of leftover little bits here. I'm going to make that into, into hamburger. Gotcha. So the one thing I, I, I want to do different is I want to have some uh, diagram of something to be able to show me where the um, cuts are coming from for different cuts of meat. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, do you ever add fat to your uh, hamburger? I haven't yet. Um, I kind of want to. Just, I mean, I. It's just to try it. I. But. No, I. I haven't yet. I. You know, I don't. I guess. Do you go to? I guess one of the things I got to learn is: Do you go to a butcher? Or do you buy that from a meat shop? Maybe. Uh, I think you can do both. I mean. I think yeah. I don't I, like you can't really go to the grocery store and maybe they'll have a fat if you go to the meat section and yeah, talk well, to the butcher in the grocery store, he might have something. Somebody was telling me, uh I think they do it with they did it with hamburger, but I don't see why it wouldn't work for for uh game. But they they sell like uh like the bacon fat ends or something like that. Like it, oh. it comes in this big bag. I remember, this guy was telling me all about it at the grocery store one day. And uh, I, I wish I would have remembered more of what he was saying, but, but uh, he threw it in his hamburger and he's like, oh, it makes it so good. And uh, whenever he said that, I was like, huh, I wonder how good that would taste in some wild game. I mean, you know, bacon, bacon, fat, bacon ends. It's like, it's like the part that they don't use it, use for the bacon or the bacon end or whatever that they cut off. I don't know. I'm probably chopping it up on explaining it. But anyways, it, it sounded really good though, is they said, yeah, we'd use that and we'd throw it in our hamburger and it makes it taste so good. So I was like, so my automatic thought was like, how would that taste in, uh, in, uh, so if I ever process my own hamburger, which I don't know if I'll do anytime soon, I do kind of, well, I'll tell you what, if I get something, I'll, I'll, I'll save some for you. Yeah, there you go. 
there you go. Or go or or uh, go down there and just buy that bacon, the bag. I mean, it's not even that expensive. I don't think maybe maybe ten bucks at the most, or I don't know. Yeah. I'll I'll try to I'll try to get better information about that and and try to figure that out. But you could probably try it. And do you have a grinder? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you could. Maybe you could go get it or something or try Hopefully. it and see what it see what it. Hopefully, this like. is how it, how it goes for us. We go do my deer hunt. Or my, what, you know, my, my hunts are going to be before yours. Um, and then I'll hopefully by the time your hunt comes around, I'll be able to have some of that ready. Oh, that would be, that'd be sweet. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll have to, we'll have to kind of, uh, yeah, break or figure that out or kind of dial that in on what we're going to do for that. But speaking of though, I was definitely, whenever I get mine processed, I was going to have them add a little bit of fat. I've been thinking about 10%, but I don't know if that's too much or too little. I think right. 15% I, is a little too much, but, but uh, 10, I think 10% is about right. Uh, Randy Newberg though, he said that I, I was watching a video of his, uh, I don't know, maybe a week or two ago. It was about game processing. And uh, so, actually some of the things that I talked about today, uh, he kind of inspired me from that video, but uh, whenever he was talking about fat, the particular person, I guess I'll kind of go in the backstory a little bit. The particular person that was getting the game, like it, Randy didn't know who it was. He was just at a processing plant kind of going through the steps of how it all works. And um, they said, yeah, this, this customer wants 15%. And Randy was like, really 15%. He's like, man, I do like five, maybe 10, you know, 10 in some cases and so um so i'm kind of curious what other people if you know leave a comment or or yeah leave a comment of some sort on the youtube or on our uh social media pages and just you know uh put out there what you guys prefer as far as percentage of fat because uh i'm kind of curious i i was planning on doing 10 like i said i don't know if that's too much or too little but but i was planning on doing about 10 percent so yep, that's probably good. I mean, it's probably one of those things you get talking about, you know, fat, you know, how lean something is, is, you know, kind of how healthy it is or unhealthy it is for you. You know, yeah. I'm sure, you know, the more fat content you're going to have, the more unhealthy it's going to be. You're not as lean. I don't know if that's even a consideration, but then again, if it tastes good, it tastes good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I imagine with more fat, it would, uh, it would taste really good but but yeah so if all you're making is hamburgers then 15 percent kind of makes sense true or a higher fat content makes sense if all you're making is hamburgers but but that and that's actually something that randy said too he's like he's like most of my wild game uh hamburger kind of usually tends to be more like spaghetti or or tacos or something in that that general idea of a food group more than hamburgers so he said that's kind of why he chooses to just do about five percent huh. interesting yeah but anyway i wanted to before we got too far off topic but that's one of the things i liked about my ice chest way of uh of curing my meat or taking care of my meat is it it gave me a chance to like to clean it too like you know if, if i happen to get dirt on it when i when i'm packing it out or something it kind of gives me a chance to kind of go through it and wash it off you know uh bring it in the fresh water every day some people i've heard you know talk say that it's not a very good idea but like i said it's it hasn't done bad by me i haven't had a bad piece of steak you know it's the whole time I've been doing it. So I'm going to keep doing it unless someone really tells me to do otherwise or points out something that I've missed, but. Yeah. Um, uh, I got a comment about that actually. Uh, so I was listening to the meat eater um, podcast and Ranella said that iced, iced down, watered down meat, tastes a lot better than rotten meat so you gotta do what you gotta do 
I, they were they were hunting in like uh was it arizona or new mexico they're hunting somewhere and uh he said uh and what were they shooting i can't even remember what the, what animal they're shooting now but but they were shooting this animal and it's like in, right now like like in the middle of summer and uh and he's like hey, yeah before we started getting a bunch of comments about putting our meat in the cooler like that's the only thing you can do to keep your meat from rotten because it's so freaking hot out there and he's like believe me the little bit of water in the meat or whatever is a, tastes a lot better than than uh, <laughs> rotten meat so so there you go but i was gonna also uh bring up one other thing though about your cooler um have you ever thought about like making it a little bit makeshift where you could like put a rack or something on it to where the ice water or the or you probably do you like it in the ice water to keep it cooler yeah, I've always I've always submerged it in the ice and water. Like I've always made sure that like everything was covered. I wonder. That's an idea, something worth looking into. Seeing, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that's I'd never thought of it. <laughs> Do you think it'd keep it cool enough though? Because that that's kind of another problem too. I mean, you'd have uh, I you know your ice and everything, but right. I mean, you might be better off buying blocks of ice at that point if you got racks. True. I mean, I'm just, I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head here. I mean, just kind of spitballing ideas, but, um, I mean, I think if you got uh, blocks of ice, it'd probably keep it fairly cool in a cooler. True, and out of the keep, the keep the racks just right above it. You know, try to maybe you could set them in there in a way where they don't quite touch the ice, but they, uh, you know, they're just right above the ice or something. So. Yeah, no, I mean, that's true. Because I know that I've heard one time that like you kind of want to keep, if you had the option, you want to keep the eye like your your meat just above freezing. Like you know, like if you're gonna cure it, you don't want it to be frozen mm -hmm. the whole time. But you just or you know, so like that's that, that there's an idea there to kind of keep it. Like if you're gonna put it in a fridge to cure, you know, you want to set it to where it's not you know, not quite 32 degrees, but, you know, not, not 30. I can't remember what the golden number was. The guy was telling me about, but you know, that, that could be an idea there too, is putting them in racks. So th this is kind of the downfall to us being so far apart. Cause another thing that we could do is, is if we were closer, live closer together, um, we could just go halvesies on a, on an old freezer somewhere true <laughs> and then just you know kind of rack it up that way turn the earth how would that work actually would you do like a refrigerator and then just turn it down or as cold as it can go or would you do uh, a freezer and that's, it? you know i i in my mind i i saw it as a fridge that you're turning it kind of you know not to down to freezing but you know you're getting it just above freezing somewhere and letting it set in that well, whenever I used to hang my stuff back in the day, I mean, you know, that, that, that was the time of year where it would, I mean, it would get up to 50 and 20 degrees at night. Yeah. I mean, maybe sometimes higher. There was that risk sometimes every once in a while, depending on when you were successful. If you're, well, cause back then we had, you know, uh, when did hunt seasons kick off like October, like October 1st or something. We went from like October into November. Yeah. Yeah, and so so it was kind of risky at the beginning of October, but but like by the time November hit, you if you got something in that time frame, it seemed like you never had to worry about hanging your meat outside. Right. And I was I, I I'm thinking that around around then like during the day it'd be about fifty, maybe sixty at the best, and then. Uh, well, that was one night, of the things that I found as I was, I was doing a little bit of research. One of the common things that, you know, I seemed to come across was is if you can, you know, if you're hanging it out and you've got to pack it out, you know, you got to, uh, the de uh, you're got you going to take the fur off of it, get it, try to cool down as much as you can, put your game bag on it and try to hang it in the, hang it in a tree or somewhere and then keep it, keep the sun from getting to it. Um, but if your temperatures are going from, you know, like 40 to 70 degrees, you, you know, you have three or four days to get your meat out. 
I, I'm sure, you know, it probably takes a day off of it as it, you know, approaches the 90 to 100 degrees. I'm sure I no, don't quote, I shouldn't say anything because I'm sure someone's going to say, someone's going to say, hey, I heard on Struggling Hunters, you're good up to leave it out in 100 degree weather for a couple of days. <laughs> I'm not saying do that. Do not do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely don't do that. But uh, that's what I've always heard too is, is uh, you know, through that whole process of, of uh, you know, every, everybody kind of worries about their game spoiling. But uh, a lot of people have said from what I've heard and, and looked up is your meat will last a lot, like kind of endure a lot more temperature than, than you give yourself credit for it to hold. So, hmm. I don't know. I mean, you know, I think you just got to kind of inspect your meat. And, and I mean, if if you're up in the woods or something, you got to hang in up in the woods. I mean, just kind of inspect it. Make sure, you know, if it's starting to get kind of warm in the middle of the day, kind of, you know, make sure. I mean, maybe you have to think of another plan or something to keep it from from getting baked out there. But Right. But uh, – I think I th- I I think that uh, you get a lot more. There, there's a lot more flex than than what we what we think there is in in our meat from spoiling to not spoiling. But um, I mean, I guess in an ideal world, though, you'd want to get it hung like you said as fast as you can. Um, and hopefully it, it's cool enough. I mean, you know, like 50, 60 degree temperatures during the day out of the sun. And then, you know, down to 30 to 20 degree temperatures at night. That's probably the most ideal temperatures. Right. I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um. Yeah, but with that being said, I think we're going to make this one a short one tonight. Um, I, As far as processing, that's been my story of processing I, I, from my first year. Like, that's how I processed everything from the time I was 12 to now. My yeah. first, like, I've thrown in an ice chest, done it that way. I'll keep doing that until a circumstance changes or I learn something new. But, uh, you know, it's at least a deer two ice chests and i'm good and i'm sure if i get an elk i'll probably do the same thing but uh i'll probably need a couple extra ice chests but (laughs) (laughs) are are you gonna uh are you so are you gonna still do your own uh, elk too you're not gonna take it to a processor that's what i'm telling myself but we'll see (laughs) we'll see when that time gets here i'll probably just be like uh (laughs) No, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I mean, if, if I had the, if I had the setup, I would definitely do it myself. I'm just not quite there yet. So. And I guess that's why I want that diagram of elk cuts. Cause I feel like that's, I wasted a lot of time last year pulling out the meat and like, what do I do with this? Yeah. And then I just start carving and, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm and if, if I'm sure if I have a diagram and tell me what to do, I could be a little bit more proficient at it. Yeah. Before we get off here, I do got one other thing to bring up. So I went scouting this, this weekend. I forgot to tell you before the podcast, but anyways, I went scouting this weekend. Uh, really didn't see a lot, man. Didn't see a lot of sign or anything. I mean, uh, I should, I should clarify that. Uh, I probably only did less than a couple of miles of actual hiking. It was mostly just kind of, I went up there with my uh, father-in-law kind of just trying to get out of town, check out the area and, um, and kind of show him around where I've been hunting the last few years. And, uh, and then we went and hiked one trail and uh, didn't see a lot of sign, nothing like that, but it was really nice getting up there though and checking it out. It's kind of nice. Uh, even though I'm, I was checking it out for like, I, I feel like I kind of seen the terrain a little bit different. Like, even though we were mostly just kind of driving around the area, I saw it different. I think for two reasons, there wasn't as many people up there. Not as there was not that many campers up there. Um, and also without that in the back of your mind, always the, or, you know, up there hunting and trying to find elk, 
um, I just saw things different. It was kind of weird. I, I, I don't, I don't know if I can explain it better than that, but I just saw, saw the terrain different. I kind of was like, Oh, you know, I don't, I don't know why I never thought about going over through this area. Like stuff like that was kind of coming to me as we were driving around, looking around, like for the scouting purpose, I guess I was more vigilant of like areas to check out than gotcha. maybe, maybe, maybe just hopping out of the truck and be like, yeah, I should be an elk over there. That's where I'll go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that some of it is, is uh, by doing this scouting thing, I, my mind was open to, all sorts of ideas where usually whenever I'm up there hunting, I already got the ideas of where I want to go. So I'm looking past everything whenever I, you know, I'm driving right past all these potential honey holes, if you will. (laughs) And, and looking past them and not really seeing them during the hunt season. So, uh, but it was good. It was good getting up there and, and I'm excited. We, we went and checked out. I was telling you about that uh four-wheeler trail yeah and uh we we probably we probably didn't even quite walk halfway of it i i know we didn't we only walked out a little ways we got rained on pretty good um and anyways uh we kind of just hung out kind of looking for sign we didn't see a lot of sign but um you know things could be different by hunting season but the one thing i noticed I don't know if this is smart talking on the pack podcast about or not, but the, well, I guess they don't know where it is, so it's okay. But uh, (laughs) it was a four wheeler trail. Right. And Uh the one thing I noticed is um, it didn't look like there was a lot of traffic on it. Hmm. Now up, up there in that area, they have like designated four wheeler trails. And the one thing that I was wondering about is most people up there nowadays have side by side, so they can't fit in there because it's only like Uh 52 or 53 inch, uh, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. The wheelbase is smaller than so. So, you know, with side by sides getting so popular, I'm thinking that uh, a lot of people can't fit in those trails. So that might've been the case of it, but I was thinking that that would probably be a strength for this hunting season too. Cause that, might be left alone for the most part True. to walk through there. But like you said, with more people doing side by sides that are have a wider wheelbase that these four wheeler trails might start getting a little more neglect not neglected, but overlooked because they can't get their side by side down them. Yeah, exactly. So so you know if, if that holds true, it might be a good good time to uh uh to go down there. I mean it might be left alone territory. Maybe. True. So, I True. mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping for. Um, but yeah, the lack of sign, like I said, we didn't really walk that far in. So, I mean, that, that could have played a part in it, but the lack of sign was kind of disheartening, but, um, but it looks like a good area. I mean, it looks, looks like a really good area. So uh, yeah, we'll have to check it out, but I just wanted to kind of share that real quick. Uh, you got anything else? No, I'm I'm good for the night. Sounds good guys. Yeah. We're trying, uh, we're trying to kind of cut it back a little bit, tighten up everything a little bit more instead of kind of dragging on for a whole hour. So with that said, uh, as always, you know, we really appreciate the love that you guys have been giving us, um, you know, help us get a little bit bigger, tell a friend or two and, uh, it won't cost you anything. It's free. (laughs) Yeah, it's totally free. And so, you know, help us out a little bit, help us get a little bigger. Uh, you know, we've been putting it, I mean, this is episode 15. We're well, next, next week will be uh, three months. Exactly. We haven't missed a week yet. So, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, we're trying, we're trying, we're trying to get better every week. And uh, with that said, I don't want to drag it on anymore, but I do appreciate you guys. The You know, you guys that are listening to us, I really do appreciate you guys giving us the, the, uh, giving us your time. I mean, that really means a lot to us and and I'm really proud of it. Uh, With that said, guys, thanks for listening to the struggling hunters. Have a good week and we will see you in the next one. Yep. Take care guys. Have a good one. Adios. Laters.